My name is Colin McLeod, and I'm as interim associate dean research for the Faculty of Arts. It's my very considerable pleasure to welcome you to the seventh University of Waterloo Faculty of Arts Distinguished Lecture in Economics. This lecture is one of many initiatives here at Waterloo uh, with the goal of enhancing the experience of students and sharing with our greater community some of the exciting and innovative research that takes place in the domain of social sciences and humanities. I'm a cognitive psychologist, so I'm very much aware of the crucial role of economics in the realm of social science. Um, and just a, on a personal note, as an undergraduate, my introductory economics textbook was written by Paul Samuelson, who in 1970, one year later, won the second uh, Nobel Prize in economics. And two of the major figures in my field, um, Herb Simon in 1978 and Danny Kahneman in 2002, have received that award as well. So you can see the close connection uh, across these disciplines. Indeed, I think research in economics is at the heart of in interdisciplinarity. It's that's so important in modern universities. So what do economists do? They use powerful tools to analyze data and to reveal the economic mechanisms that underlie social interaction in the broadest sense. Whether thinking about the future of employment, the complexities of immigration policy, the determinants of economic development, or indeed health and child development, economists offer a unique perspective into the workings of society. In a world that's ever increasing in complexity and that we know is saturated with information, not all of it trustworthy as we're learning, we cannot afford not to seek answers to these questions and to learn from those with the relevant expertise. The Faculty of Arts at the University of Waterloo is proud to contribute to disseminating knowledge and to continuing to be a source of extensive, reliable information for the public. The distinguished lecture, I think, will make you think. It will make you think about your world. It will expose you to deep ideas developed by a renowned economist dedicated to answering questions that are pressing questions for our times. Over the, six, the past six years, this series has introduced outstanding economics researchers, um, and the seventh speaker is certainly going to be no exception, as you'll shortly learn. Uh, in closing, there's a couple of people I have to thank, a couple of groups I have to thank. I wish to extend a heartfelt thank you to the economics alumni, especially if you're here today as alumni, um, for generously supporting this lecture series, and in particular to Brian Lipsky. Um, organizing an event of this stature uh, does take a lot of resources and a lot of time and organization, and the Faculty of Arts and the Department of Economics are most appreciative of our alumni for their continuing support to our commitment to fostering meaningful dialogue. In that regard, also, I should note that uh, alumna Jennifer Lee is here today. She's a senior economist and director at VMO in Toronto, and she will be around this evening to uh, be available to speak to students about careers at the reception following this lecture. And now, before I actually give the lecture, because <laughs> I've been up here long enough, uh, let me now turn the podium over to Professor Laurie Curtis, who will introduce the speaker. Okay, thank you. Um, I am very happy to have the pleasure of introducing Professor Janet Curry as the 2019 Waterloo Arts Distinguished Lecturer in Economics. Dr. Curry's accomplishments are vast, and listing them would take pretty much her whole lecture time, so I'm going to do a brief uh, overview. Professor Curry is the Henry Putnam Professor of Economics and Public Affairs and the coordinator of the Center for Health and Wellbeing at Princeton University. She also co directs sorry, co-directs the program on families and children at the National Bureau, Bureau of Economic Research. Dr. Curry has served as the Chair of Economics at Princeton University from 2014 to 2018. She also served as the first female Chair of the Department of Economics at Columbia University in 2006 to 2009. Dr. Cur Curry is currently the President of the American Society of Health Economics and has served as the President of the American Economic Association. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Political and Social Science, the Society of Labor Economists, and the Econ Economic, I can never say that, Econometric Society. She is a member of the National Ac Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Medicine, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 2016, Professor Curry received the Carolyn Be Shaw Bell Award for mentorship um, by 
the American Economic Association and was named a nom NOMIS, N-O-M-I-S, Distinguished Scientist in 2018. She has served on the board of reviewing editors of science, the editor, editor of the Journal of Economic Literature, and on the editorial boards of numerous journals. And her publications, well over 100 by my count, have been widely published in all the top journals. Given her accomplishments, it's not surprising that Dr. Curry, Curry is ranked as one of the top female uh, economists. Professor Curry is a pioneer in the economic analysis of child development and its role in the development of social inequalities. Her work has been instrumental in demonstrating the long-term impacts of early childhood intervention programs, health insurance coverage, and pollution exposure. Her research program has been instrumental in producing the evidence needed to support expansions in health and access to healthcare, pro healthcare and social programs in the US Canada and elsewhere. My own experience is that of her research that was widely referenced when the national child benefit was being uh, discussed, implemented, evaluated, and improved over time in Canada. Dr. Curry's research currently focuses on socio socioeconomic differences in health, access to health care, envir and environmental threats to health, and the important role of mental health for children. Please join me in thanking her for sharing her research, Child Health as Human Capital. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for coming to hear me. I'm delighted to be here. One of the questions that I often get asked is, what are you doing as an economist studying child health? Uh, so I thought I would start with that one and uh, talk about the way that economists see child health as a form of human capital. Okay, so what is capital? If you just look at a dictionary defi definition, two of the definitions you would get are that it's, a, it's wealth in the form of money or other assets that are owned by a person or organization and available for a purpose, such as starting a company or investing. Another definition is that it's a valuable resource of a particular kind. Okay, so I'm going to argue that human capital is a particular form of wealth that's embodied in people. And uh, historically, economists, to the extent that they've looked at this, have focused mainly on education as a form of human capital that uh, if you invested in it, which all the students here are doing, right? You, you invest, you forego earnings, and then you hope that that's going to generate a return in the form of higher income down the road, but also maybe other kinds of returns that are less tangible. So he's, child health was thought of something that affected uh, well-being primarily by affecting people's education. And uh, increasingly, that's what's changed, is that child health has been recognized as something that's very important for somebody's future well-being by itself, uh, beginning even with the prenatal period. So a lot of the first research in this area was about the importance of the fetal period, and that importance, I would say, is now well established. Researchers have looked at many different shocks or events that could happen while somebody was pregnant and looked at the effect of that on the developing fetus and how that person then uh, subsequently develops. The effects that people find are, are quite large, and since the period in utero is short relative to somebody's whole life, it suggests that concentrating social investments during that period could have a really big payoff in, in terms of making people healthier and more productive. Um, this research, uh, one of the things that's interesting about it is that it provides evidence that the sort of paradigm that a lot of people have in their heads that, you know, is it nature or is it nurture, is not really a very good way to think about things because it's always both. It's always some interaction of whatever your natural endowment is and the environment that you're in. So I'm going to show you uh, a few examples like that. So one of the measures of health at birth that's really widely used is birth weight. 
Um, partly this is a matter of, of looking under the lamppost where the light is in, in the sense that birth weight is measured, it's on the birth certificate. We have millions of birth certificates all with birth weight. So we have a lot of data on this outcome. And you can show that it's related in systematic things uh, to, to outcomes that we care about. So for example, I did one of the early studies using data from something called the 1958 British birth cohort study, which was a really ambitious study. And what they did was that they measured every single person in Great Britain who was born in a particular week in March 1958. And then they followed them up. Uh, I looked at them when they were age 33, but they've continued to follow them up over time. And what you could show was that just knowing somebody's birth weight predicted differences in their uh, whether they were going to be employed and what their earnings were at age 33. Okay. And a similar thing using the same data set, a, a study by Case, Fertig, and Paxson, showed that birth weight also predicted educational attainment, so maybe that was one of the mechanisms. Uh, this study has become quite famous by Case, Slobotsky, and Paxson because what it showed is that People not only start out different in terms of their health, depending on, um, because there's a relationship between income and birth weight, but that that relationship between health and income tends to grow as people get older. So what this graph is showing, it's along this axis, income. And here it's the log of family income, but basically income gets bigger as you go to the right. And then this is a health score where a one is good and a five is bad. So as you go up, health is getting worse. Okay, so what does this show? This shows that people who are in poor families have worse health on average at age zero to three. But this curve just gets steeper as the kids get older, which is showing that income becomes an increasingly important determinant or, or at least predictor of health as people get older. Okay. So we know that there's this relationship between socioeconomic status and health. You might think, well, that's US data. You know, Americans, they're crazy. They don't have public health insurance for everybody like we do. And so uh, we wouldn't see the same thing in Canada. But in fact, you do. And one way you can see that in this uh, table is that these numbers, if you follow this row, are getting bigger. And uh, that indicates that the effect of uh, income on health is getting bigger. Okay? You could also sort of just compare them to the numbers above, which are for the US. The numbers for the US are all bigger than the ones for the same age group in Canada. So this relationship between income and health is stronger in the US that it, than it is in Canada. But you still see it in Canada. So even though everybody has public health insurance, you're still seeing a relationship between income and health. Going back to birth weight and how predictive it is for future outcomes, you see that um, in this graph, uh, what this is doing is this is based on a study in Manitoba where they took all the public health insurance records and linked them to educational records and records from the um, social support program. Okay? So the outcomes that I'm looking at here are whether children were in the right grade for their age as of age 17. Uh, and I have two versions of that, depending on whether they were in a low-income family or not. And then the orange bar here is whether they were ever on welfare. Okay? And so what you see is that kids who are the lowest birth weight uh, are much more likely to have one of these negative outcomes. And uh, particularly for the educational outcome, it's worse if you are in a low-income family. Okay? So this is showing you a little bit about the interaction between income and health in the sense that both of these people are having the same negative health event. They're born very low birth weight. But it has a bigger impact on the kids who are from the poor families. Okay? And then you can see that as you get to higher birth weights, the probability of one of these negative outcomes falls 
fairly dramatically. Okay, so that's in Manitoba. Uh, this example is from California, and what it's doing is we were able to link birth certificates for mothers and their babies. Along here, we're showing the mother's birth weight, and along here is the child's birth weight on the y-axis. Okay? So the line slopes up, so that says, you know, mothers who are bigger at birth have babies who are bigger at birth. Okay? So there's a certain amount of determinism here in the sense, you know, you can't help how big your mother was when she was born, right? But there's two lines because one of them is for people who lived in, where the mother lived in the highest income zip codes at the time she gave birth. And the other one is for mothers who were living in the lowest income zip codes at the time she gave birth. And you can see that for the mothers living in better circumstances, the children are systematically bigger. So no matter what the mother's birth weight was, having more resources is associated with a better outcome. Okay. And this, this graph is just quantifying that, looking at uh, the sort of overall effect of the mother's birth weight on the child's birth weight, and then showing that it's different in the two zip code categories. Okay. So I've showed you some data that indicates that health at birth is important, that it's predictive of future outcomes, and now what I want to do is talk a little bit about what we can do about that, and one of the things is uh, providing adequate health insurance for everybody, adequate access to health care. So I'm going to talk about kind of an extended example of that from the American case where they, in the late 80s and during the 90s, extended public health insurance to many mothers and their children. So the program I'm going to talk about is called Medicaid. It's a public health insurance program for low-income women and children. It was greatly expanded, as I mentioned, starting in the late 1980s. And these expansions, because this program is targeted at low-income people, had bigger impacts on low-income people. Uh, and I think this gives us an opportunity to assess and maybe appreciate the value of the public health insurance that we have. Okay, so this graph is showing uh, for the US, the fraction of women, 18 to 44 years old, who would be eligible for public health insurance coverage of their pregnancies if they became pregnant. It went up from about 12% of mothers in 1980 to 43% of mothers by the beginning of the 90s, and it's still today about 50%. So a lot of people don't know that about half of the births in the United States are paid for by public health insurance and then the babies are covered for a year after that. Okay, so this was really a huge expansion of coverage for these people, but it had different impact in different places. So this was kind of a federal initiative, but different states had really different starting places. So in this figure, the places that are shaded darker are the places that had the biggest increases and you can see a lot of those were, were in the South because these were historically kind of ungenerous states that didn't have very uh, generous public health insurance programs. So I did some of the initial research on this expansion, looking at the immediate effects on children and found some pretty dramatic effects. There was an 8.5% reduction in infant mortality. And we could show that one of the mechanisms for that was through accessing care. So particularly among the poorest mothers, you saw a 50% reduction in the fraction of them who were delaying getting prenatal care. You also saw uh, in the data a big uh, response of the hospital industry in that children were getting more intensive care. Uh, hospitals were building neonatal intensive care units in response to people now having health insurance coverage. So there were a lot of immediate effects. What I think is really exciting is that there's emerging new evidence about the long-term effects of that expansion. Because these cohorts whose mothers were covered, say, in 1990, you know, now are 
um, you know, 20, 30 years old. So you can look at data today, identify the cohorts of people who are covered, which is different in different states and years, sort of find them in the data and say, well, how are they doing relative to the people who, who didn't have that coverage? And so this study by Sarah Miller and Laura Weary d does exactly that using a, a number of different data sets. And what they find is that young adult children of mothers who are eligible for Medicaid coverage of their pregnancy are a third of a standard deviation, less likely to have a chronic condition. So that's a pretty big effect. They have fewer hospital visits, and they're a, a little bit more likely to graduate from high school. When they drill down and try and look at the poorest people, they find even larger effects. Uh, this plot is illustrating the effect on hospitalization. Um, this is using something that economists like to call a regression discontinuity design. But anyway, what, it, what it's based on is the fact that this new coverage law applied only to children who were born after September 1st, 1983. So if you were born on August 31st, 1983, you were just permanently out of luck. You would never be eligible for this program. Okay? So this line here at zero is saying, okay, we're going to make zero September 1, 1983. All these people are born up to 50 months before. All these people are born up to 50 months afterwards. Okay? And so the point is that you know, there is a decline in hospitalization rates going on anyway, kind of a secular decline, but there's also a jump down that this cohort of children who got public health insurance are just less likely to be hospitalized than this cohort uh, just before them. And as I say, the effects are even bigger when we look at the poorest children then we find uh, two-thirds of a standard deviation reduction in the probability of having a chronic condition, fewer hospital visits, uh, even more likely to graduate from high school. But there are also significant effects on a whole range of other outcomes. So uh, a little bit of an increase in the probability of ever attending college at all, um, an increase in personal income, a decrease in the probability of using the most common welfare program, which is the food stamp program, or the, um, it's now called the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, but everybody still calls it food stamps. Uh, and then a very interesting finding that I'll come back to is that these children who you know, were basically eligible for health insurance from the prenatal period had a reduction in their Kessler 6 mental distress score. So this score ranges from 6 to 30. And so a reduction of 2 is actually a pretty big impact. Um, so, and so you can take away from that that they had better mental health. And it's related to this chronic conditions part, because if you look into well, what are the kind of chronic conditions that affect young adults, mental health problems are really high on that list. Okay. So they not only expanded health insurance for pregnant women, but also for children. This graph is showing uh, sort of how that played out. If you look at the earlier period, the rates of eligibility for public health insurance were from about 15% to about 20% of children. And over time, went up so that about 40 to even over 50% of children are eligible for public health insurance. Uh, it was phased in first for the youngest children, which is the blue line up at the top here, and then phased in later for the oldest children, but eventually they all end up uh, at a similar place. Okay, so there's a big expansion for children as well. Looking at what effect this had on this gradient that I was talking about, you can see that if we look at the sort of before, five years before all this started, and compare that to the five years once these expansions were mostly put in place, you end up with a flatter gradient, especially for the youngest kids who got the coverage first. 
Okay, so the uh, y-axis here is hitting at a much lower level in the later period than at the beginning period. Okay, we, so this is one of those cup is half empty or cup is half full type of graphs because you can clearly see that the lines are getting flatter, but they're not flat, right? So we're not getting rid of the gradient, but we're reducing it by giving people public health insurance. So another way to look at this is to do a comparison. And uh, so I've done some work comparing Canada and the US. In some ways, this is a good comparison. You know, we're both big countries. We drive a lot. We have lots of car accidents, which is an important cause of morbidity. We have similar kinds of medical technology, similar levels of wealth. But of course, Canada has had universal public health insurance since the 1970s, whereas the US had First, this large expansion to pregnant women and children, but then basically nothing happening until the Affordable Care Act in 2014. Okay, so what we do to try and compare countries, which is always a little bit difficult, is to first rank counties, or in the Canadian case, census divisions, from richest to poorest, and then sort of group those counties into bins where every bin accounts for about 5% of the population. So by doing that, we can say for different points in time, what was going on for the bottom 5% of the population compared to what was going on for the top 5% of the population. And we can do that for every 5% throughout the distribution. We can do that for census years 1990, 2000, and 2010. So in each census year, we're going to compare mortality for different groups. Okay, so this somewhat busy graph is trying to uh, summarize what we found. Okay, so let me walk you through this. The red lines here are for Canada. The blue lines here are for the US. The y-axis, or the x-axis here, is the poverty percentile. Um, so what you have to remember about that is that here, this is zero is the places with the least poverty, and 100 is the places with the most poverty. So you can see that all the lines slope up, which is again this gradient that I've been talking about, right? So places that are poorer have higher mortality rates. Okay? And that's true uh, in the US. Uh, it's also true to some extent, but a lesser extent in Canada. So in Canada, all the lines are flatter than in the US. Okay? Now, if you look at the different, oh, and then I should also say the thin lines here are for 1990, and the thick lines here are for 2010. Okay, so taking the case of zero to four year old females, what this shows you was that uh, in 1990, death rates were similar in the richest places in Canada and the US, but they were much higher in poor places in the US than they were in Canada. So there's a really big gap right here. Okay. Moving to 2010, both of these lines have fallen a lot, so child death rates fell in both the US and in Canada. But in Canada, they fell in kind of a parallel way, so the line was already fairly flat and you know, things were getting better for children in all parts of the income distribution. In the US, you have a, a large reduction in death rates for kids in rich areas, but a much larger reduction for kids in poor areas. Right? So these lines for the US and Canada become you know, very similar relative to how they were before, especially for the poorest people. Okay. So that's for the zero to four year old girls. If you look at boys, you see similar kinds of patterns. Uh, and then the sort of takeaway is that that's really different if you look at other age groups. So if you look at 40 to 44 year old women, for example, what you see is that in Canada, there's a, a little bit of a disturbing trend here in that mortality fell more in the rich places than in the poor places, although it fell for everybody. But in the US, there was essentially no decline at all. Right? So 
mortality had been declining for a century, it just stalled for middle-aged people, which is something that uh, a, a lot of people are very concerned about. For males, it looks a little better. You still see big declines among the poor. Uh, a lot of this is actually declines in violence over this period, which accounted for a lot of deaths for males. Uh, but you don't see the line in 2010 approaching the line for Canada. And then for the 60 to 64 year olds, again, you see declines in the US, um, but you don't see a, a sort of convergence between the US and Canada. So my takeaway from this is that the only place where you see convergence in death rates is for kids, which is the group in the US that got public health insurance. So I think this is fairly dramatic um, evidence about the effects of public health insurance on mortality rates. Uh, another approach to looking at this, um, somewhat similar, is a paper by Wilson and Lurman who look at the rollout of the public health insurance uh, service in the UK. And uh, this was rolled out for different areas at different times. So again, you can follow up cohorts who were covered and compare them to the cohorts who were born just before and not covered. And, what they, and because it happened a long time ago, they can look at people's health 50 years later and they find a 14% reduction in mortality at age 58 for the covered cohort. So they're able to trace this really long run effect. Okay, so what I've been showing you is that children who have access to health care from the earliest period prenatally um, and in early childhood live longer. Um, but as an economist, I get asked, okay, fine, do they earn more? Maybe crass, uh, but people do care about that. And it's possible that this kind of intervention could actually not result in people being more productive. You know, what if you're saving a whole bunch of people who have health problems? You know, they might not earn more than other people. So this type of uh, administrative data that I've been talking about allows one to look at long-term effects by finding people today and then linking back to what was happening at their time of birth. This study by Brown, Kowalski, and Lurie does that using US tax data. Okay? So you have a tax income tax record for everybody who files tax records. Uh, and Actually, in the US, since they have an earned income tax credit, which is refundable, a lot of poor people file taxes, even if they don't pay taxes, because they get a credit back. So they actually have pretty good coverage. And what they're doing is setting everybody's earnings at age 19, or I guess this is actually the tax that they paid at age 19 to zero, and then saying, how does it grow over time for these different groups? So this group is the group that was affected by the Medicaid expansions, people with family incomes less than 200% of the federal poverty line, because a lot of these programs are set in terms of your income has to be less than the, a certain fraction of the federal poverty line to be eligible. And so you see that there's a big increase in the taxes paid by age 28 of about $1,700 for each year of Medicaid eligibility between zero to 18. So they're again finding a very big effect on people's um, productivity and earnings and the amount of tax that they're paying. Okay, so I'm gonna pivot again a little bit and say, well, um, so this is showing that health is really important. One thing that may be particularly important is mental health and the reason for that is that it's such an important driver of adult outcomes. Many mental health problems start in childhood but manifest in young adulthood uh, and are a, the major cause of working days lost. Okay, so if you look at prime age people and why they might miss work, this is kind of one of the major reasons. Also, mental health problems kind of map into traits and skills that we know are really useful in the labor market. So some of the things that people talk about are you know, focus, internal motivation, stress tolerance, ability to get along with others, 
Um, and if you think about those as being on a continuum, people with certain types of mental health problems will have difficulty with all of those uh, capabilities. Okay. Just uh, speaking to the prevalence of these kinds of problems, this graph is showing data from the General Social Survey in the US, which is a big multi-purpose survey that asks people about all kinds of things. Uh, since 2002, they've been asking them this question that's at the bottom. Now, thinking about your mental health, which includes stress, depression, and problems with emotion, for how many days during the past 30 days was your mental health not good? Okay, so that's the question. Um, and what I thought was extraordinary is the number of people who say that they had more than 10 days in the past 30 days when their mental health was not good. Uh, that's this line here. It's about 15% of respondents. It's pretty constant. It doesn't actually even tick up very much in 2008 when you had the Great Recession. Okay. So that's a lot of people who are responding that they feel that they have a significant mental health problem. Um, if you ask people whether they had any bad mental health days in the last 30, that's getting up to be 40 to 50 percent of people. Okay. So it's a pretty big thing by people's own self-reports. You could look at other types of data. Uh, at one type of data that you can look at is emergency room visits. Um, this data here is based on information for six states where I had every record of everybody who visited the emergency room in 2014. And then you can just look at what the diagnosis codes are to see why are they visiting. So out of 1,000 people, you have about 380 visits to the ER every year. And about 50 of those, or 13%, would have some kind of mental health diagnosis code on the visit. And then you can dig into a little bit, well, what are those things? And you know, one thing people ask, well, are they all substance abuse problems? Uh, if you look at people who have a diagnosis code for mental health, which is substance use, and they don't have any other mental health code, that would be about 2.8% of visits. But really big categories are actually mood disorders, like depression, and also anxiety. So, so mood disorders are about 5%, and anxiety is another 5% of people that are showing up in the emergency room. Okay? So a lot of people are using health care because of mental health problems. Um, I should also add, in the United States, that's what people are advised to do. So if you're having a mental health crisis, you're advised to go to the nearest emergency room. Uh, and then the emergency room, even if it doesn't have psychiatric services, will do some kind of assessment and, and triage. Okay. So these mental health problems, as I mentioned, often begin in early childhood, and they can affect um, educational attainment. Um, this table is from some work that I did with Mark Stable at the University of Toronto, looking at the effect of having uh, been diagnosed as a child in elementary school on uh, middle school academic attainment. And we had similar surveys in the US and in Canada, uh, so we could sort of graph the same thing for the US and Canada. So looking at probability of grade repetition uh, here, the blue is whether you had any mental health problem in the US data. The orange is the same question in Canada. And then specifically looking at ADHD, which is one of the most common problems for elementary school children in the US and also in Canada. Okay, so what this is showing is that in both countries, you're getting increases in grade repetition, decreases in standardized uh, math scores, where you have a somewhat different test in Canada than in the US, so you're getting a little bit more dramatic effect in the Canadian data. Um, we didn't have a reading score in the Canadian data, so this is just for the US. And then looking at also for the US, whether kids were in special education or not, uh, they were a lot more likely to end up in the special education track if they had a mental health problem. OK. so. Um, that was looking at middle school. We've also used the Manitoba data that I was describing earlier to look at 
the effects on young adults. And there, what we wanted to do was to compare the effect of some common physical health problems to the effect of having mental health problems in childhood and look at how predictive those were of future outcomes. So we were comparing mental health problems to uh, asthma and injuries. We picked those because those are the most common reasons why kids would end up in, uh, in the hospital for physical health problems. So this Manitoba data, we end up with 50,000 children and their siblings. We could merge the records to educational attainment records and information about welfare use. And the design here is to compare children with a problem to their own sibling who didn't have the problem. Okay? And so the reason why we would do that is to try and compare, to, to control for uh, characteristics of the families that might be different on average. Okay? So it's not a perfect control but it does control for a whole range of things that would be the same, like the household that you're living in, for instance. Okay. So this graph is plotting the uh, regression coefficients, actually, looking at the effects of uh, ADHD injuries and asthma on, in this case, whether you receive social assistance after age 18. So the striking thing here, or at least what struck us, was how much more predictive having ADHD or a conduct disorder, that's what CD is, was for this outcome. Okay, so compared to physical health problems, which really weren't having a tremendous, uh, tremendously large impact. Looking at another outcome here, uh, in Manitoba, you have to take certain math courses in high school to be eligible to go to university. So this was looking at whether kids were taking those courses. And again, if they had ADHD or conduct disorder, uh, they, they were much less likely to take those courses, especially if they were being treated for it at age 14 to 18. We could also look at persistent uh, mental health problems. And so here, that's the orange bar. The other bars are saying you were diagnosed and treated at a particular age, and then the orange bar is saying you were diagnosed or treated at multiple ages, and that has a larger effect. Okay, so trying to link this information about mental health back to what I was talking about, prenatal conditions and so on, there is a fairly large body of literature linking prenatal conditions to mental health problems. The, some of the most famous and um, striking studies on this line were looking at the Dutch hunger winter, which occurred when the uh, Germans invaded the Netherlands and um, basically some parts of the country people starved. So this was the part where uh, people were eating tulip bulbs and things like that to try and survive. So uh, because that happened at a very particular point in time, um, they can follow cohorts that were affected by the famine and see how they did later in life. Uh, and they showed a fairly strong link with schizophrenia. Uh, other work, this paper by Malaspina, has looked at the uh, six-day war in Israel and found uh, a long-term effect of uh, sort of acute stress uh, also on schizophrenia. Looking at things a little bit less drastic than schizophrenia, uh, papers using administrative data from Denmark compare identical twins. And again, if you have the data for all the identical twins in the whole country, you have a pretty big sample. Um, and they find a strong association between birth weight and future ADHD. Another recent, very interesting study uses Swedish data. And uh, here again, they have the data for everybody in the whole country. And they focus on women who suffered the death of a close relative during their pregnancy compared to women who suffered the death of a close relative right after the birth. So you'd think about the nine months of the pregnancy compared to the nine months after the pregnancy. And what they show is that uh, having this 
tragedy happen during the pregnancy increased the probability that the children used an ADHD drug by 25% and also increased the probability that they used drugs for anxiety or depression by 13% and 8% respectively. Okay, so there was a very long-term effect on the mental health of these children from this very stressful event that happened to their mother during pregnancy. OK, so that's pretty depressing, right? Uh, <laughs> so the question is, well, can we do anything about it? Uh, and so I think the research there is hope it's a bit more hopeful. Uh, so I've been doing some work looking at different kinds of programs for pregnant women. The one that I'm going to talk about is called the Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, or WIC. Okay, so Supplemental Nutrition, it sounds like it's a feeding program, and it is. Um, but I think the largest effect of it may be in the way that it's delivered, because it's delivered usually through maternal and infant health clinics, they're mandated to put women in touch with providers. They offer sort of comprehensive services. So it's a kind of a one-stop shop where a pregnant woman could go. And yes, they get a nutrition benefit, but they might also get a checkup and get some advice and support and getting in touch with different social services. So we looked at this program in South Carolina. Um, this was a program where women were covered while they're, while the baby was in utero, and then we follow the children six to 11 years later when they're in elementary school. Uh, these children were born between 2004 and 2009, and we could follow them up to 2015 in Medicaid claims data. So when we do that, what we see is that the kids were less likely to be diagnosed with mental health conditions. Uh, so overall, they were about um, you know, 5% less likely to be diagnosed with ADHD, and about, you know, six and a bit percent less likely to be diagnosed with other, this is sort of all mental health conditions that are commonly diagnosed in childhood besides um, ADHD. That's what the orange one is, and then the blue one is ADHD. And the effects were bigger for African American children who, in South Carolina, are more deprived. So there's some evidence here that the type of intervention has an even bigger effect for the children who are more deprived to begin with. Okay, So uh, I think a question is, well, if these programs like Medicaid that I talked about and WIC and other programs, if those are making people so much better, why in the news do we always just hear about how everything is getting worse? Right? So one reason is the in the very recent increase in suicides for teenagers, which has actually reversed 20 years of declines since 1990. Um, so that's really important. Uh, another thing that I want to talk about, though, are just diagnostic standards for many conditions. And the fact that if you cover a whole bunch more people, and they start going to the doctor, and they start getting screened, then you're going to find more stuff. Right? And that's a good thing, not a bad thing. So let me just talk a little bit about those things. Here's the graph for the US suicide rate for 15 to 19 year olds. Over that period that I was showing you the comparison in mortality between US and Canada, that's like 1990 up to 2010, you saw a pretty steady decline for males who have much higher suicide rates than females. That's down here. Where and for girls, nothing was happening. And it's really since 2010 that you've seen an increase, and especially since about 2015. And nobody knows why that's happening. Right? So that's a very urgent topic for research. The reason why I put this black line here is because this is the year when the black box warning went on to um, SSRIs, the most common type of antidepressant. So the black box warning for uh, people less than 18 was that these drugs could actually increase suicidal ideation in kids. So people should watch out. 
that was accompanied by a big decrease in use of SSRIs. And a lot of people thought that that would have a very negative effect. Well, it's not obvious from the time series, right, that it was that that did it, because you just don't see much happening. The increase seems to be a bit later than that. So, OK, so that's an important problem, which I don't have a lot to say about, but except that we need to do more work on it. Um, I want to turn to the uh, diagnosis and treatment aspect. So what this graph is showing are prescriptions for ADHD. Um, so here, the top blue line is the fraction of kids who are being treated for ADHD. And that's about 3% at any point in time. This is US data. And what's interesting is the comparison of the red line and the green line. So the red line here is the Medicaid kids. So I was talking about Medicaid. And then the green line is kids who have private health insurance. So if anything, there's a decline in prescribing for kids with private health insurance. And it seems like all the prescribing increase is going on for Medicaid. Okay, so what's going on with that? Why is the public health insurance program prescribing more for kids? One reason is because they changed the way the program is organized. And so um, I think this part of my presentation speaks a little bit to how important the incentives for providers are and uh, how changing things in a small way can lead to a large consequence. And so what did they do? They switched from what was called fee-for-service care, which means that the doctors reimbursed on the basis of every service that they provide, to what uh, people in the States anyway call managed care, which means that the provider gets a payment, and then they're supposed to provide all the care within that payment cap. Okay? Um, so other things being equal, that might give the provider an incentive to do less. So they were worried about that. So they said, OK, well, we'll give you a higher payment if, you're, if, if the child that you're treating has a chronic condition. Okay, So now they have more of an incentive to find chronic conditions. Um, the other thing is that they made them accountable for doing screenings. So in Medicaid, all the kids are supposed to be getting basic health screenings all the time. But very persistently, only about 40% of them ever do. So they gave them incentives to find chronic conditions. And they said, we're going to hold you accountable if you don't do screening. Okay. So we looked at the effect of this, again, in South Carolina, where in different counties they changed the plan at different times. We have all the kids in Medicaid. Uh, and we do two different things. One is to look at all the children who are sampled any time in the two years before and after, see what happened. And another thing we can do is we can follow the same child and say, well, here's a child. They were in Medicaid. They're being treated. What happens once they go into managed care? Okay. So I'll show you uh, how that looks. If you uh, look at the fraction of kids getting well-child screenings, and this is the year of the change, before the change, they're less likely. And after the change, they're more likely. Okay. And then this plot here is showing basically the same pattern for ADHD. Before the change, they're less likely to be diagnosed. And after the change, they're more likely to be diagnosed. Okay. So kids get more well-child screenings. They get more diagnoses. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Right? A lot of people feel pretty negative about that. Um, but if you look at uh, mental health, but also physical health, what you see is the kids were getting diagnosed with all kinds of things when they were getting more screening. So they're more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD, also with depression, um, also with asthma. More mild infections were being caught and treated. More ear, nose, and throat conditions were being caught and treated. More autoimmune conditions being caught and treated. Okay, so so you screen more kids, you get more cases. And so that's an important thing to realize. Okay. So I've been talking about a little bit about prevention, a little bit about diagnosis. Uh, what about treatment? 
of mental health conditions. And I don't have a lot of answers about this, but I just want to show you how much variation there is in the way that people get treated and argue that uh, just as the US has sort of been a laboratory for looking at what is the effect of public health insurance in a way that's more difficult in a place where, you know, so in Canada, you basically rolled it out pretty much all at once, and so it's hard to see what the effect is. In the US, you can really see what the effect is. In the same way, the US may be useful for looking at the effects of mental health treatments because there's huge variations in treatment. So what this map is, uh, every unit here is a county, and it's looking at prescriptions of antidepressant drugs by county per 1,000 persons 10 to 19 years old in 2014. The darkest color here is essentially one prescription per person. Um, that's 967 plus. These are 30-day prescriptions. Okay, so you might, it's, it's not quite as bad as everybody in the county being on antidepressants, but it's still a pretty impressively high number. And then the lightest color is zero. Okay, so you're ranging from zero to really high rates. Um, part of that is because um, general practitioners are prescribing a lot in some parts of the country and not in others. Here, the darkest color is indicating that 20% of the general practitioners have prescribed antidepressants to children in their practice. And some of that, in turn, may be because there's many areas that are not well served by psychiatrists. So here, the lightest color is showing areas where there were no psychiatrists who were prescribing to children. Okay, so what this has shown is that there's this really widespread use of antidepressants in 10 to 19 year olds, even though I told you about the black box warning. Uh, there's only two drugs that are actually FDA approved for use in pediatric populations, but there are many drugs that are in widespread use. They're all being used uh, so-called off-label, 70% uh, of prescriptions. So it's really unclear what the effect of this massive experiment that's unfolding will be. Um, and so this is something that I'm, I'm currently working on, trying to see what the effects are. OK, so just to, to um, summarize then, uh, I've been arguing that child health is a really important form of human capital. I've tried to show you that child health, uh, even measured using something as crude as birth weight, uh, is predictive of important future outcomes that we care about, like education, earnings, employment. And uh, while, of course, improvement of physical health remains important, there's now increasing understanding that mental health is also really important for explaining all of those things, and that um, mental health diagnoses in children are increasing as well as treatment, and we don't know very much about the effects of that treatment. So there's a lot of room for future research. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> yes, so he's asking about uh, whether I've looked into um, the health of the family and how the health of siblings may affect uh, each other or their parents. Um, and I think that's a really interesting topic for, for research. In a lot of my work looking at sibling comparisons, I try and limit to siblings who are really close in age and who are in the same family circumstances, just so you're not getting siblings you know, 10 years apart living with different you know, maybe different dad or something like that. Um, I do think it's a really important thing to think about spillovers between siblings. So uh, it may be naive to interpret some of my results as saying that uh, if one child has a mental health condition in the household, that that has no impact at all on the other children in the household. Uh, if you think it probably negatively impacts them too, then what that would say is that what I'm 
get ending up with is kind of a lower bound on the effect, right? Because I'm comparing the the person with the condition to another person who's also negatively impacted. So I've also thought about that a little bit. Um, I'm currently working on trying to identify effects on parents of having a child with a mental health condition. Because I think that um, there is some work looking at having a sick child, generally, as something that's really stressful for parents. But I think um, mental health conditions may be uniquely stressful in the sense that a lot of times you know, the diagnosis is pretty uncertain. Nobody really knows what to do. A lot of things that people try don't work. Um, and the parents may not get very much social support in that everybody kind of implicitly blames the parent, right? Which they don't do if the child has cancer. They don't say that's because it was a bad mother, right? But in, um, in psychiatry, there's a long history of saying that the child's mental health problem is due to, in particular, the mother being a bad mother. So I think it's probably pretty stressful for parents. And I'm trying to look into that. I think that's a brilliant question. <laughs> um, so he asked um, how the kind of health effects that I'm talking about affect the intergenerational cycle of poverty and what implications they have for how it can be broken. So uh, what you said, I think, is exactly correct, that uh, that is kind of on the depressing side, that um, an implication of this work is that there's a lot of children who start out in life with a very unequal um, playing field because of you know, maybe health insults that their mother suffered uh, or things that, they're, that happened to their mother. Um, I guess in terms of thinking about what to do about it, I don't want to put more burden on mothers, right? So a lot of the discussion, you know, if I write a paper and it shows that something else is bad for fetal health, the discussion always seems to be, you know, like, well, what should mothers do to avoid that thing, right? So if air pollution is bad for fetal health, what, what should be mothers be doing about it? So then again, it goes directly to the bad mom thing, right? Like, oh, you didn't do that, you know, you're a bad mom, uh, which I don't think is very helpful. Um, so I, I tend to try and focus more on my own work on, um, on you know, what society can do, like what kind of programs can we have that are effective, what sort of information is useful for people, you know, uh, getting it out there. Uh, there's some really interesting work being done looking at the effects of um, actually making data available about air pollution in China. And then people take avoidance measures, and that seems to have measurable effects on their health, right? So that's a fairly simple thing that governments can do, and Western governments do do that. They could arguably do it better. Uh, so I prefer to think about it more like that um, than thinking about, you know, well, what are the things that the mothers ought to be doing that they're not doing? They shouldn't smoke. That's my one. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll go for that one. But, yeah. uh, that is true, although on average, everywhere in the world, richer people are healthier. So there's always exceptions, and I'm talking about averages by the nature of what I'm doing. What, the way that I conceptualize it is, you know, well, what is it about poverty that causes bad outcomes? Uh, I think a sort of working definition of poverty is like bad things happen to you. So it, like if you're poor, more bad things happen to you. You know, you have a lousy car, it breaks down, you lose your job, um, you know, you're, you're trying to walk to work, you get hit by a car, you can't pay your medical bill, and so you know, more, more bad things happen to you than happen to other people because you don't have the resources to prevent them or to maybe respond to them. Um, in uh, work with Mark Stabile, we were looking at how this gradient happens. You know, why is it that the gradient gets steeper as the children get older? And one of the things that we found was that uh, for poor children, they just had more negative health shocks. So they would recover from health shocks at about the same rate as richer children, but sort of every time they're recovering, they get knocked down again, 
you know, whereas the rich kids, maybe one bad thing happens and then they have lots of time to recover. Um, so that, that's the way that I think about it. So that's a good question. I, I tend to focus on birth weight because it's much better measured than gestation in most of these data sets. Also, most of the low birth weight babies are premature, and so it's like 80% of them are low birth weight because they're premature. I know doctors feel strongly that it's different to be small for dates than to be normal for dates and be premature. But I, I haven't done that much with that in my own work just because, uh, like I say, the data on gestation is really not very good. You can see it if you plot it. If you plot birth weight, you get a nice bell curve. If you plot gestation, you get this huge spike in 39 weeks. This, you know, doesn't occur in nature, so. That, yeah, that's a very good question. So the question was, what about ethnicity-adjusted birth weight? And uh, I wouldn't entirely rule it out, um, but I certainly wouldn't go there first um, because there's so many things where people thought that there was some sort of genetic difference, and then it turns out to really be uh, an effect of environment. Um, so I guess I would look for all environmental causes before I, I went there. Um, I, I did a recent study looking at the effect of air pollution on asthma. Well, actually, it wasn't really about air pollution on asthma. What, what it was about was location and asthma, because there is a literature that looks at the fact that African-American children have much higher asthma rates than non-African American children and says, well, you know, maybe there's just some kind of genetic difference that makes people more disposed to have asthma. And what I found was that if you looked at white kids who were living in heavily African American areas, they had the same asthma rates as a black kid. So it's really the area that people were living in and not um, any difference between the kids. And the, the fact that people were just very racially segregated in terms of where they were living made it hard to see that. So that, those maps that I was showing you are from data that tr tracks all of the prescriptions from retail pharmacies in the whole country. So it's comprehensive. So if there are no prescriptions in those places, there are no prescriptions in those places. So I guess it's hard to say at this point whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, right? In the sense of these other places where you have like over a tenth of the kids being medicated with antidepressants seems maybe excessive, but who knows if we don't really know what the effect of any of these drugs are. Right? Because one of, the, one of the issues, so we have this gold standard of doing clinical studies, but clinical studies have their own issues. Um, and one of them is that you can seldom track people for very long. Right? So you might find that the drug is safe and effective for three months, six months. You know, some of the longest term studies follow people for, say, you know, nine months. But if a parent asks you, oh, well, what's the evidence regarding, is this going to help them graduate from high school? You know, the honest answer would be, well, we have no idea. Yeah, so she's asking about uh, whether the increasing obesity rates are affecting the distribution of birth weight. Um, and the answer is yes. And uh, one, if, if, if you just look at these, so I'm a total data nerd, right? I've been looking at uh, data on birth weight now for, for more than 20 years. Um, in the early 90s, if you looked at the distribution of birth weight, you'd see hardly anybody at uh, less than 1,500 grams because babies didn't really survive at those low birth weights. And you didn't see anybody over 4,000 grams either because there weren't very many. Now, the whole distribution has kind of spread out. So you see lots of babies less than 1,500 grams. It's pretty common to survive at that low birth weight. But you also see 
lots of babies over 4,000 grams or even over 4,500 grams, uh, and that causes its own issues. So very big babies are more likely to be born by cesarean section. Um, the mother may have complications during labor and delivery and so on. So yeah, the whole distribution is changing in part because of mothers being heavier. Yeah, so th this is a really uh, hard issue because we, um, I mean, there's lots of compelling evidence that implicit biases exist. I think what people shouldn't jump to the conclusion that all of the disparities are because of implicit biases of the providers, right? So the providers may be making mistakes and doing things that alienate people, even if they have good intentions. But that doesn't mean that that's the only problem. So uh, there's a really interesting study that came, just came out uh, pretty recently in uh, San Francisco where they recruited a bunch of black men from barber shops and places like that uh, who were all uninsured and said, hey, there's this clinic, you know, we'll give you free medical care. And so a bunch of people came to the clinic and then when they came to the clinic, they were randomized to see either a white doctor or a black doctor. Okay, so all the doctors in the clinic were there recruited like, oh, we're going to go and we're going to provide free medical care to people that need it. They were all on board with that, right? So they all have good intentions. And um, in the study, they gave all the men, before they saw the doctor, a chart which had the picture of the doctor on it. So they knew whether the doctor was white or black when they filled in the questionnaire. And they asked them, you know, well, here's a bunch of preventive services that you could get, like diabetes screening, cholesterol screening, and so on. Which ones do you want? And they fill it in. And there wasn't any difference in what they asked for. When they saw the doctor, though, uh, the ones who saw a black doctor got more services ex post. So uh, it wasn't that the ones that saw the white doctors got less services. It's that the black doctors were much better at persuading the black patients to get more services than they initially said that they wanted. Right? And then they found lots of cases where people had undiagnosed diabetes and very high blood pressure and really high cholesterol levels and things like that. So they were able to, to, to treat them. So it's also the patients you know, the, the communication, the match, seemed to be important, as well as the doctor's uh, intentions. Well, first of all, I would just really like to thank Janet for such a, a fascinating uh, and insightful talk. I know I personally learned a lot, and uh, it's changed my perspective both on health and on economics to see you bring it together this way. So I, I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Um, also, underlining the importance of publicly available health care. Um, and speaking as, as dean, I guess I should have introduced myself because you probably are wondering, who is this person? Um, <laughs> I'm Sheila Ager, and I am the dean of the Faculty of Arts. And I have spent the last few months learning a lot more about this faculty. Uh, and I think your, your talk perfectly encapsulates that the increasing importance of health research in a whole variety of areas, such as, for example, social sciences. We don't have a medical school here, but we have a, a lot of very important health research going on, and this is the kind of thing that I think of, so you're a model for us. Um, so thank you very much again for a, a really wonderful talk. Okay, thank you. Yeah.